Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar entitled Water Quality for Fish Owners. I am your host, Dr. Jesse Sanders. I am a certified aquatic veterinarian and the owner of Aquatic Veterinary Services out here in California. Before we get started, just a few things to mention. Uh, to your right, there is a little section entitled Questions. If you do have any questions during the presentation, please enter them there and I will answer them at the end. You also have access to three different handouts for attending this lecture. The first is Five Tricks to Healthy Fish. On the back of this is a list of all desirable water quality parameters that we will be talking about in a little bit. An article, Stress-Free Water Quality for Koi Owners. Certainly, if you're a member of one of your koi clubs, I highly recommend giving this to your koi club members. Lots of great information in there. And then we also have an article on water changes. Um, some people we find are still unfamiliar with the concept of a water change and what exactly it is and what you need to do. So this is a very basic handout that will go through the process of performing a water change. So starting out, what is water quality? Water quality is the testing of certain chemistry parameters in water. So this is done for almost any water system, ponds, lakes, city waters, water treatment facilities, fish tanks, koi ponds, basically anything that has water in it is probably tested in some way. The parameters that we are concerned of in fish include your nitrogen cycle, which is ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate, pH, alkalinity, also known as KH, and hardness, known as GH, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and copper, chlorine, and hydrogen sulfide. So how do you know if your water is clean? It looks clean. There's never been a problem. The fish are sick. The water is fine. Well, sure, these might be great excuses, but the only way to know that your water is clean and safe for fish is to test the water. I'll give you the next example. So you have two glasses here. Both appear to be nice, clean water. However, one could have a pH of around four and be very, very toxic to fish and the other could have a dissolved oxygen content of zero, which again is not compatible with fish life. So even though your water can look completely clear, it's not telling you the whole story. Uh, people want water to be clear. Fish don't really care so much and can actually thrive in watery environments that say aren't up to human clarity standards. So how do you test your water? Well, you wanna start with a water quality test kit, and I do not mean these strips. Unfortunately, a drop-based kit will give you much more accurate results than these strips do. Yes, we understand the strips are better than nothing. However, if you can use a whole jar of them at the same time, you will get conflicting information, especially if they've been left out for a while. So we recommend the API or Nutrifin drop-based test kits. Um, these are widely available. You wanna make sure that they have a range of nitrogen parameters, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, pH. They have the KH test kit. Depending on where you're located, your GH or hardness might be off the scale already. So it's not really something that you're gonna to need to test for on a regular basis. So first we're gonna start out with the most important component of water quality, which is your nitrogen cycle. So yes, I know that, koi, that clownfish do not live in ponds, but the basic nitrogen cycle in a fish system has fish producing ammonia from their gills and excreted in waste. This is converted by nitrogen fixing bacteria in your biologic filter into nitrite and then into nitrate. The nitrate can be taken up by aquatic plants in your pond. However, most of your nitrate is gonna be removed by water changes. So first we start out with ammonia. This is a primary fished waste and excreted through the gills and urine. Even though the fish are producing this, very low levels are toxic to fish. So 
high ammonia because mostly results in neurologic syndromes that can either have buoyancy disorders, position, body position disorders, lethargy, inappetence, and death. The next stage of your nitrogen cycle is nitrite. So this is, again, the primary product of ammonia breakdown. Even at low levels, this is highly toxic to fish. There's actually a disease with high nitrite called brown blood disease, also known as methemoglobinemia. Basically, nitrite will actually compete with oxygen on hemoglobin in the blood, turning the blood a lovely brown color and keeping oxygen from binding to the hemoglobin. So basically, this can cause your fish to asphyxiate no matter how much oxygen you have in the water. And then finally, nitrate is your secondary product after nitrite. High levels are toxic to fish. However, low levels, and this will be species specific, some fish cannot tolerate over 20, but mostly this is usually okay for fish to be swimming around in. So how do you manage these products within a fish system? Most importantly is gonna be your biological filtration. So this is your filter pads, your bio balls, any sort of bacterial media that you have for these good bacteria to grow that are gonna move your nitrogen cycle along from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Please keep in mind that if you are treating the water and the parasites with any sort of antibacterial treatment, it will take out some of your biologic filtration. So again, if there's other options to treat your fish rather than treating the water, it will save your biologic filters a lot of wear and tear. Water changes. So in our little handout that's been included, water changes is physical removal of water from the system. And it does not just mean topping off your system from evaporation. When water evaporates, it doesn't really bring anything with it except hydrogen and oxygen. So this really isn't gonna do a lot for you. Um, it's not really gonna dilute the chemicals back to unless they were in their usual form. You can't, we highly recommend that any fish water is used to water plant systems. Plants love fish water. All those nitrates are really good for them. So highly recommended that if you're doing water changes and taking water out, use it to water your lawn, water your plants. As long as there's no medications in it, you can water vegetables that people are gonna eat. And then plants. So yes, plants will remove a small percentage. However, if you have just a few water lilies and say a 3,000 gallon pond, you're not really gonna see a big effect on your nitrates. Yes, it is easier in aquariums that you can heavily plant. However, this comes with other issues. If you really want to get the best bang for your buck out of plants, we recommend adding an aquaponic system. This will increase the amount of flow of your total volume going to your plants and therefore be able to remove the nitrates quicker. It also allows for more plants to be in a system without the little fishies trying to munch their roots. So that was the nitrogen cycle. On to pH. So pH measures the amount of hydrogen ions in solution. So it's actually a negative 10 log base scale. So Basically, a move from a 6 to a 7 is actually a 10 times increase in the hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. So this is what we have here as just a range of different things that you might come across. Most water that we have out here is in the 8s, and that's perfectly fine for most fish. So it's always a good idea to test your source water, whatever you're using to fill up your pond or tank, just to know where your pH is about coming in. And most well-maintained systems will settle out very closely to what the source water is doing. These hydrogen ions are very important because they affect all biologic processes. This is internal and external. Keep in mind that blood diffusion of these hydrogen ions occurs on the outside of the body in fish, specifically at the gills. So anything that's floating around in the water will have an immediate direct impact on any fish that's swimming around in the water. The most important thing to consider with pH is you want consistency. You want a pH that is not going to change over the course of the day, week, months, years. 
You will have species specific tolerances, especially for some of the fancier varieties of fish. For those of you with koi and goldfish, they can tolerate a pH between six and a half to nine. Most of the systems that we see are between seven and a half to eight and a half. If you are trying for that perfect seven pH, unless your source water is reading seven, it's going to be a big struggle. So we just recommend picking something that you can manage and you want to remain stable throughout the day. Well, how does this happen? So stable levels in your pH are brought about by your KH. So this measures the amount of buffers in the water. So what is a buffer? A buffer is a compound that binds with those extra hydrogen ions that are floating around in solution that the fish are producing as part of their biological metabolism. And the buffers will keep those hydrogen ions bound up and will not affect your pH. GH is a part of this. This is actually mostly calcium related compounds, so this provides some buffering, but mostly it's just going to add to hard water deposits and some changes in your fish. No water hardness is really going to affect your fish unless it's too low. You may see some black speckling, which is basically just mineral deposits in fish that have very hard water. If this is a big problem for you, we highly recommend getting a water softener. And you can use it throughout your house, on your plants, property. Um, it is a significant investment, however. So following along with our nitrogen cycle and pH are two syndromes we're going to be talking about. The first one is called old tank or pond syndrome. This occurs in a tank or pond that is not cleaned or undercleaned for a long period of time. Essentially what happens is you end up with high ammonia, a very low pH, we're talking down in the fives, and a KH of zero. So in this, since you haven't really been cleaning too well, you've burned through all your buffers. You have no buffers left. So any biological processes will just be spitting out more hydrogen ions. However, you won't see many deaths in your fish because the low pH protects the fish gills from ammonia damage. The only thing you might see in this syndrome is a fish that, say, gets sick from something else, failure to thrive, they have a couple off days here and there. It's really hard to be able to detect this just looking at a tank. But again, it's very easy to test for. So if you have a system that you've been ignoring, the fish are doing okay, but they haven't really been doing great, definitely something you want to test for. However, if you do find that your system has this, do not jump through and just do a giant water change. So especially with pH, if you swing it too hard too fast, you will kill all your fish. So problems with pH, you need slow and steady correction. This means you're going to be doing multiple very, very small water changes. This is really what's going to be best at correcting this problem. And then once you've corrected the problem, your ammonia is down, your pH is back to normal, your KH back up above 100, you can go back to, well, not back if you haven't been cleaning very well, but you can go to a better regular water change schedule, which we'll be talking about more in a little bit. And then on the other side of this is a new tank or pond syndrome. So this happens when you have a new unestablished filter. You either replace the filter pad, filter media entirely, or it's a brand new system that you didn't have any other filters to add to. With this, you will see high ammonia, but your pH and KH will be normal. Basically, this happens in any new system that needs to establish its biologic filtration, and it will need four to six weeks to establish bacterial colonies. This four to six weeks is temperature dependent. So in the summer right now, you're looking more at a four week change. However, coming into winter, you'll probably be closer to six weeks. In order to correct this, you will need to perform additional water changes. Depending on your ammonia, you can do up to 50%. We really never recommend going higher than 50%. And definitely don't mess with your filters until that four week period is up. With your testing, you will see spikes in your ammonia, your nitrite, and your nitrate. So this is basically as the cycle is establishing itself, you'll see up big supplies in their ammonia. And then as the bacteria work their way through that, they'll have a big spike of nitrate. 
And then your new bacterial colonies will be established to convert your nitrite to your nitrate. And then once you're on the nitrate, you're good to go and can start your regular water change schedule. Dissolved oxygen. Now, unfortunately, there are not many test kits that can test for dissolved oxygen. Um, however, it's really easy to spot. So the oxygen in the water, you want a minimum of 12 milligrams per liter. This is usually incorporated through a waterfall, filtration, aerator, fountain. Um, depends on how your system is set up, but you must circulate your oxygen throughout your tank or your pond. You can use power heads and outflow to direct water. You really want to make sure that there's essentially no dead spots in your water. So areas that there's not getting any water flow can actually deplete all the oxygen, especially in outdoor ponds that have algae. And then if a fish swims through this, unfortunately there's no oxygen to breathe, so they can die just from a dead spot in your pond or tank. Keep in mind that algae can suck oxygen out of water very quickly. Um, this is especially important with systems that are outside. So during the day, when the sun is out, you can get lots of lachy algae growth, and basically at night, everything will settle out and die, but as soon as the sun comes back up, the algae wakes up, and although they do produce oxygen, they also consume it as well, and getting caught in one of these switchovers between on and off for your algae can suck the oxygen out of your water and essentially asphyxiate your fish. So signs of low oxygen can be slow lethargic fish. Basically, if your pond or tank looks like a stagnant puddle and your fish really don't want to move, adding oxygen is a great thing to do. Um, you can, so if you are going to add aeration, we just put in a caveat that if you're going to put in anything that is on the bottom of your pond or your tank, that you make sure the bottom of your pond or tank has been cleaned recently because one of the things we're going to talk about is um, hydrogen sulfide, which can be released if you put an aerator on top of a big pocket of it. Salinity. So first we're going to talk in freshwater fish. So really the only reason you need to be adding salt to a, a tank or a pond is to treat different parasites. So there's certainly some that are very easily treated with salt and therefore are not going to affect your biologic filter. You will need to keep salt levels consistent for effective treatment. So anytime you do a water change and remove water with the salt from your system, you will need to add salt back with the new water. If this is going to be a part of your regular routine, we recommend that you purchase a salinity meter. There's a digital one there on the left. I think you can buy it on Amazon for about 30 bucks. And then the refractometer on the right is certainly more expensive, but much more hardy. For fish systems, if they are not sick, you do not need to add salt. Sure, it might help with osmoregulation just a little tiny bit, but really, if you're going to have problems measuring out and adding it every single time you do a water change, we just recommend that you forgo it. Um, certainly, it's good to have around for parasite treatment. Some fish and owners might feel better if there's a little bit of salt in there, but if you're not adding salt, do not feel guilty about it. These are freshwater fish, and they like their water fresh and not salty. So for the saltwater guys, you will need a specific salt formula, and that's specific to either fish or corals. So they have different chemical makeup. Basically, if you want to have great corals, we recommend doing a coral mix in your water. If you're just going to have fish and maybe just a few corals and then you can just go with a fish mix. So definitely gonna be specific to what your overall goal is. There is a species specific salinity tolerance and not only is this level, it's range. So again, you're going to lose, especially for a heated reef tank, you're gonna be losing a lot of water during the day and therefore your specific gravity, your salinity is going to rise. So if you have a very delicate fish species that can't take that, you might need to add water a couple times a day just to make sure that your salinity doesn't go up above the range. Always important to know your species. There's lots of great databases online where you can find out what your species needs. So you will need a hydrometer. Um, they make a lot of these plastic ones that are very cheap. They are around about $5 and they work very well. Again, the refractometer is a good way to go. 
With saltwater systems, you need to test daily. It is very important to have that ready on hand. And we recommend to have, that you have heated salt water ready at all times. So if accidentally you add too much fresh water one day, rather than dumping a bunch of salt right into your tank, it may be better just to add a little bit of diluted heated salt water. That's really what's going to be best for those systems. And again, if you have to do a water change, you already have the water ready to go. So now we're on to our not so fun components of water quality. First of all is copper. So this can be used as a treatment option for some parasites. Uh, copper sulfate is the most common form. It's a blue color. However, this is toxic to invertebrates. So if you have any corals, shrimp, crabs, crustaceans, they will die from copper treatment. And high and chronic levels can actually become toxic to fish. And usually there's no specific signs. Again, it's going to be kind of just a general malaise, lethargic, Inappetent, you might see a death here and there. Um, important in ponds that are open to the public because people, no matter how many signs you put out, will throw coins into fish ponds just because they don't know any better. So make sure if you can find the source. Again, if you have an outdoor pond or tank, any building projects, roofing, gutters, any of those little tiny shreds of copper that from drilling holes, you want to make sure those stay out of your ponds. Old uh, systems might have copper piping, so that also needs to be removed. And like I said, the signs of illness will be very nonspecific. You might see lethargy, it might be ulcers, inappetence, a lot of different things to be seen with copper toxicity. However, again, this is another very simple thing to test for. This is one of the things you can actually use those little test strips for, because if you have any copper in your water and you're not treating, it's going to be a problem. Chlorine. So chlorine is added to city water in order to make it safe for humans. And there's two different forms that are used, chlorine and chloramine. So how do these two differ? Chloramine is actually a more stable form of chlorine that's also mixed with ammonia. So a double dose of fun stuff for your fish. If you add anything that's going to take away the chlorine, you will release additional ammonia into your system. So if you will be using a dechlorinator, we recommend one that can treat chlorine and chloramine. If you know your city water just has chlorine, you'll be okay to do the aeration test for 24 hours to get to kind of bubble that chlorine off. Unfortunately, chloramine will stick around for a week or more. So that's why it's being used more often. Both of these are toxic to all fish. Doesn't matter, salt water, fresh water, chlorine will kill fish very quickly. If you're not sure what's in your water, we definitely want to test your source water. Again, these are one of those tests where you can use those little test strips. If it comes up at all positive, you need to treat your water. And you always want to make sure that you add dechlorinator when you're changing your water. So any new time, anytime new water enters your system, you really want to make sure that you have a dechlorinator that will treat chlorine and chloramine. Hydrogen sulfide. This is also known as um, methane. So basically, hydrogen sulfide occurs in tanks and ponds when pockets of waste and debris are buried deep. Um, it's produced by anaerobic bacteria that are colonized when a spot in your substrate no longer gets any oxygen. So again, a system that you just don't clean very regularly, doesn't get a lot of oxygen, it's going to start producing these bacteria. And then these pockets of gas are released into the water when your muck is stirred. So when you go into that cleaning after six, seven years, if you smell a rotten egg smell, congratulations, you have just released hydrogen sulfide. This is a very, very toxic chemical and can cause deaths in less than six hours. So if you haven't cleaned your pond in a really long time and you suspect some of this stuff is down there, we highly recommend that you evacuate all of your fish, amphibians, reptiles, invertebrates, before you go mucking around down there. Um, definitely going to save the lives of your fish if when you get in there a big bubble comes up and you suddenly smell rotten eggs. So if you are at all suspect, we always recommend that you get the fish out first. 
So that concludes all of our different parameters. Um, how often do I test my water? This is something that we get asked quite a bit. For a stable established system, you really need to test once every two to four weeks. This will depend on your stocking density and how much you're feeding your fish. Fish that are more heavily stocked and get fed more will have more issues with waste products. So this goes back to your nitrogen cycle and your pH. So definitely something to test regularly. Once you are able to kind of know your system, you'll be able to even predict where some of your levels are going to be. Any new system or new equipment, such as a filter, you really want to test every one to two weeks. This is especially important in new tank and pond syndrome. You want to make sure that you catch all of your changes in ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate. Ongoing general illness. So not quite sure what's going on. If it is an issue with your water, you really want to make sure that you keep testing until you know the problem has been taken care of. And again, especially if you've treated with a water-based antibiotic, your filter might be back at, base, at square one. So make sure that you know what your filter is doing at a regular time. So if you're not testing regularly, here are some of the signs that you might have some water quality program, problems. Generalized fish sickness. All every fish disease is made worse by poor water quality. So any ulcer, ulcers, inaptance, sudden death, parasites, everything gets worse with bad water. If you have one fish that's acting odd, so little Timmy fish isn't swimming right, doesn't want to come up to eat, just quite isn't acting himself, first thing you do is test the water. Uh, lots of different fish uh, facilities, fish uh, stores will test your water for free. So we'll highly recommend that you take advantage of that. And if you're suspecting anything at all, look at the water first. Like I said before, it's rare to see an actual change in the water. There won't be any change in odor, color. Well, hopefully you're not tasting it, but you won't actually see any changes in the water physically in order to indicate that there's a problem. The only way you're going to know for sure is if you actually test the water yourself. Well, this is a slide you've probably all been waiting for. Um, this is your general water quality parameters. Uh, this is available on that first handout, the five uh, tips to healthy fish. But um, I'll give you a minute if you're scribbling that down. And again, this is just a very general parameter list. For some species of fish, it's going to be a lot more specific as far as nitrate and pH. And yes, I know some people recommend that alkalinity only be 50. But however, in very heavily stocked systems, we have seen problems with only a 50 milligram per liter dose. So we recommend 100. All right, moving on. So what if there's a problem? So you've tested your parameters and you've noted something wrong. So you have a high ammonia, nitrite, or nitrate. You want to do an immediate 50% water change. There are different uh, ammonia binders that you can add. However, we have found that these are not a permanent fix, and you will need to do additional water changes to get them out in the future. Depending on your levels, we really recommend that you call a professional and get their opinion. You basically say, my ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, is this, this, and this. What do you recommend as far as water changes? If they don't mention the word water changes, I'd get a different professional. Certainly, if you have water quality issues, that is something that we can help you with over the phone or email. We have no problem working with you on that. If you have a low alkalinity and an irregular pH, so again, this is something that your source water just might not have enough buffers in it to begin with. So you will need to add them. There are many fish safe products available. Most readily available is baking soda. You can get it in any supermarket. Um, again, any pH problems need to be correct, cor corrected slowly. 
so you don't shock the fish and ruin their pH. So always take into consideration you want to do this very slowly. So if you have low dissolved oxygen, you want to immediately add an aerator. However, like I said, if you are a suspect of your bottom substrate and it hasn't been cleaned or it hasn't been cleaned well, you can put an aerator in. Just keep it off the bottom of your pond or put it on a rock, flat surface, egg crate, milk crate, excuse me, anything that will keep it up off the bottom just in case you have some of that hydrogen sulfide in there because most aerators vibrate quite a bit and that can actually make things a lot worse. And then with high copper, uh, you need to find the source and remove it from the system. There are some different well systems that will automatically come in with high copper. So if that's the case, you may need to add a deionizer, deionizer to your system. Um, it will certainly also help with your hard water problems. So again, this is more of a problem for those of you that are living on well systems. High chlorine or any chlorine, you want to add a dechlorinator immediately. I, I don't care what kind of dechlorinator it is. If you only have the sodium thiosulfate, I'd add that regardless. So again, chlorine at any level is very, very bad for fish. However, very, very low levels will also be seen as kind of a general lethargy. You can lose fish after a chlorine spike for up to two to four weeks, actually, that we found with very, very low levels of chlorine that just come in at a very small dose every little bit. So basically think of it as arsenic poisoning. And if your fish are dying from an unknown cause, um, first thing you want to do is call a professional and perform a water change. Uh, especially if you don't have access to a test kit and you have more than one fish that is sick, definitely do a water change. Again, make sure that you never do more than 50% of a water change. Um, change doing 100% water change, especially for small systems, can really mess with the pH of a system and cause a lot more um, problems. So this is especially important in little beta bowls. If you have a fish bowl, chuck it and put flowers in it. All fish deserve to have nice filtered water. So no 100% water changes, 50% is really the most that you want to do. So in conclusion, clean water equals happy fish. Good water quality is the number one thing you can do to keep your fish happy and healthy. You want to get a test kit, and if yours is older than one year old, get a new one. Yes, some of these Test kits will have expiration dates on them. Well, guess what? That expiration date is only good if you do not open the test kit. It's mostly just there for shopkeepers to know when they need to rotate their stock. So if your test kit has been open for more than a year, it's time for a new one. Test regularly. I really cannot stress this enough that water systems with fish need to be tested on a regular basis. True, you don't have to test as much when you have a very well-established system that you aren't adding any new fish to, you're happy with your filtration, your fish aren't really going to grow much more. It really is going to depend on your system, but at least once a month test is going to be great for any fish system. And address any problems that you notice as soon as possible. Water quality issues are not something that you want to wait on. Definitely talk to your aquarium or pond professional or an aquatic veterinarian. Um, there's two different databases that are available if you need a veterinarian. Um, first one is fishvets.org and the other is aquavetmed.info. Uh, there are plenty of well-stocked aquarium shops, pond clubs, pond maintenance companies, pond builders who know a lot about water quality. And if they don't, you can teach them because you now have just sat through this lovely presentation. So that's really what I see as the cornerstone. And if your water is good, it will do the most for you in keeping your fish happy and healthy. So if anybody has any questions, um, now is the time to ask. Um, as part of this registration, you do have my email address. You can just respond directly to the webinar content that's been sent to you. Uh, 
Um, hopefully those handouts are very helpful. Um, if you have any more questions about water quality, you can email me. Um, if you want my email, it is CA, short for California, fish vet, F I S H V E T, at gmail.com. And certainly you can always check out our website, cafishvet.com. And that will kind of give you an idea of what we can do. And like I said, we're happy to answer questions about water quality over the phone and email. It's one of those things that I'm not going to be prescribing anything. So I am happy to help with all of that. Our staff is more than equipped to handle all of water quality things that come down our line. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, for joining since we don't have any questions. Um, like I said, please contact me if you have any follow-up information. This webinar has been recorded, so if you have any friends that would be interested in tuning in at a later date, please let me know. Thank you very much for attending, and hopefully we'll see you at a next webinar soon.